All right, guys, we're gonna get started. Um, so welcome to week three. This week we're covering box model and spacing for the programming portion of the lecture. Um, if you guys are wondering about attendance, that'll come at the end. We have like a QR code you can scan and then you can submit your attendance there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so just some like review over CSS selectors. Um, a lot of you guys like got confused about like what specific tags in like the starting code for HTML are. So the head tag is basically like a special part of the HTML document that stores like a bunch of information about what the document contains. So if you think about like the title of a web page, like in the like in your browser, um, head stores that um, you can put it like as a title tag. And then body is where all the content that you see on the screen is actually going to show up. So um, yeah, that's where you should be putting all of your like assignment code, at least for like homeworks one and two. And then header is also like a tag for content, but it's like the same thing as div, but just don't confuse it with like the head tag itself, even though they like sound similar. Uh, wait, let me make sure I started the recording. Oh, here. Um, oh yeah. Um, yeah, and the CSS reminders is kind of confusing. Color refers to like the text color of an element and then background or background color, they're interchangeable. They just use um, to change the background color of anything. Um, for fonts, you can, uh put every font attribute like separately or you can also combine them together um i prefer to do it separately just for like declarative purposes but like either way works and then make sure to have a semicolon at the end of the line because if you don't have that weird things can happen um and hover effects make sure not to have a space in, like after the colon make sure it's like the tag and the colon and then whatever pseudo selector you want to use um yeah so i guess this is just like some review of like how to access things nested. So for example, if you wanna like access H1 and LI tags, um, you would separate them with a comma and this will basically select all the H1 and LI tags listed in the HTML as you see there. And then say you wanna access like the LI tags specifically within food list, like you want the, the first three LI tags but not the bottom three, um, then you would do something like this where you put the ID of like the outer div first or like outer element. So you do the like hashtag food list and then I lie after that with the space in between. And then, yeah, so if you want, it's like the same thing where if you want to like select um, all elements with the class highlight at, in like the UL, then you have UL space dot highlight. And then, yeah. So now we can get into the actual content of this lecture, which is the box model. So basically the box model, you can think of it as like a picture. Um, so at the core of the picture is like the content itself. So this is basically everything that you're seeing. Hopefully you guys can see that all right. Um, but yeah, it's basically like the thing that you're looking at. And other than the content, there's like the padding, which is like the space between the picture and the picture frame itself. And this is useful for like, you don't obviously don't want everything to be clung together or else the visual design would be really bad. Um, so yeah, this is just used to put space between the picture and the picture itself um the border um, i'm sure you guys are familiar like picture frame you can style different borders in css however you want them to appear um and the last element is the margin which is like how far apart you want pictures to be um yeah so when you condense all these down you can see like all the elements of each one highlighted here and then from this they basically develop the css box model which looks something like that um yeah so this is pretty much this review uh content is the picture Padding is the space between like the picture and the picture frame. Border is the actual picture frame itself. And then margin is used to separate different like pictures um, from each other. Um, yeah, so this is basically something that looks very bad. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is basically just pure HTML. There's no spacing, visual hierarchy. It's pretty hard to read at the same time too. Um, so if we wanna make this into something that still looks pretty bad, but it's like slightly better than what, we, what it was before. Um, we're gonna add this these CSS attributes. So basically um, the content itself is gonna be covered in like the width. So the width of um, the element is like the content itself. And then if we, you see like the white space around um, the content is the padding, which is why we put padding 15 pixels. And then say we want to have this like kind of ugly border um, that's like solid sky blue then we can do that. And then we want margin in between um, the 
Welcome to Wadada and homework three will be released tonight. So that's where we'd like to have the margin there. Um, do you guys have any questions so far? Okay, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so for spacing, there's like, obviously like, I'm sure you guys are aware, like top, bottom, left and right. And if you wanna specify that in like, um, for padding or margin, you do like padding, like hyphen, and then like whatever direction you want, top, um, right, bottom or left. And then padding and margin, um, the same rules apply to those. Yeah. So I guess here's an example of like things with different padding on the sides. So if you wanna put, I mean, this looks really bad too, but like if you wanna put padding on the top 10 pixels and then right 20 pixels, bottom 30 pixels and then the left 40 pixels, it'll be hella off center, but like this is just for the purposes of demonstration. You can also, instead of listing out each one like sequentially, you can list them out, um, I guess, in the last line of the code where it basically goes like top, right, bottom, left when you list out four, um, I guess, padding pixels in a row. So that's kind of like, it interprets them as going clockwise. Um, yeah, so I guess margins follow pretty much the same thing where the content is the green box. And then uh, we have like different margins on the top, bottom, left and right. And you specify it in the same way. And this will basically like push anything next to the green box um, outside of like the tan colored box. So if you put like another element right next to it, it'll definitely be outside of that tan colored box. So it's just used for separating elements from each other. Yeah, I guess units, um, pixels are basically like tiny squares that make up your screen. I'm sure you guys have heard like, I don't know, like a, a 4K resolution, that's like 4K pixels. Um, yeah, so 100 pixels is like approximately an inch. Um, it's good for cases when you know like the exact size of something, like say like we tell you we want this to be eight pixels, then put eight pixels. Um, but pixels don't do not scale between like phones and laptops. So say you want something to be like a thousand pixels, like you can't fit that on a phone. So when you go onto the phone, it'll look really messed up and distorted. So that's why we have um, I guess percents. So these basically um, depend on the size of the parent HTML element. Um, and it's useful like to a certain extent for responsive design. So say you want like a box to be like half the width of the screen, then you could do like 50% assuming like the screen is like 100 or like the outer div is 100% of the screen. Um, basically with um, basically just uh, like takes the page width and then specifies it based on uh, how wide it is relative to the body. So the body will always have 100% width and all the elements within it, um, their width will depend on that. But the thing is that like, if you have, um, I think, I guess if you have the like 100% width for like the, like the body tag and you have another element within it, that's like 50%, that element is like 50% width, right? And if you nest another element within that 50% width, like the 50% is relative to like already 50% of the screen. So in reality, it'd be like one half times one half, which would be like 25%, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. so units for typography, I'm sure you guys have also seen like Google Docs, like 12 point font, um, it's pretty inconsistent. So usually we recommend you stay with pixels or percentages. And yeah, I guess that's what kind of what we're running with in this class. And then I guess for like the last portion of the CS programming part is like introduction to layout. So these are pretty much um, designs where you can break down like what a page looks like into different elements. So you have like your header and then you like P tag underneath that. And you have like the margin between like the white box and like the outside. Um, I guess the thought process is like, you want the, like, the white container to always be centered on the page and hundred pixels from the top. So should the container like be a set width or like 600 pixels or like, I don't know, a percentage. Um, we usually, I guess for this one, we want a pixel width because like 50% like if you take 50% of your phone screen, you probably can't read any of the text that's actually on it. So I guess for this example, we would want something like 600 pixels. And then this is basically like the code we would need to make it up. So um, HTML is at the top where we have like the container and then H1 and P tags. And the container is 600 pixels and you have like margin left auto and margin right auto are things that basically, if you give an element a width and apply like the margin left auto, margin right auto, it'll automatically center the element in the page um, in terms of like horizontal wise. And then we add margin top on uh, 
like the top for 100 pixels. And then, yeah, so I think the thing to remember is like, if you want to center something that has a width, you can use margin auto. And then we'll also be getting into like tools and future lectures about how to center other things without using margin auto, because sometimes you don't want a predefined width and you just kind of want the HTML to flow uh, without defining that. Um, yeah, so I guess what you guys have seen so far, I'm sure you've seen in homework one, is that like when you put an element, like an HTML element and put one right underneath it, then when it actually renders, they're like, go, they go basically in blocks. So there's like one line and after um, that renders, it goes on a new line. And that's pretty much how, um, I guess HTML is normally like defaultly styled. So sometimes we want like side by side layouts. Um, and that's where CSS display attribute comes in. So the default is display block with like pretty much everything going on its own line, regardless of like how wide it is. And that can sometimes like be a waste of space on the screen. Um, you can use margin and padding to like fix it, but usually using too much can, doing too much with the CSS will kind of mess up your code. Um, so what we have is like display inline block, which is basically like, it goes on the same line. Um, there's no like automatic new line and it also like uses margin and padding so you can space out elements however you want. And display inline is like not as good because it all goes on the same line until like you run out of space, but it also doesn't respect like margin or padding or anything like that. So if you want things side by side, we recommend using um, display inline block. And this is just like a, like the same CSS like pattern we've seen before, where it's like display is like the CSS property and then inline block or block is like the CSS value. Yeah, so I guess this is an example of how you use inline block. So you do like display inline block and then float left basically means you want to align it to like the left side of your screen. So if you want to align it to like the right side, then you want to do like float right. And in which case, like the two text boxes will be more to the right than they are here. And then I guess this is kind of like an exercise for you guys to think about when you're thinking about like breaking down layouts. Um, so I guess this might look really complex. This is like a really outdated picture of Facebook, but um there's a lot of elements on this page and i guess if you want to like decompose this um like page you don't want to like code every single part and then be like oh i messed this part up and have to recode the whole thing right you kind of want to build simple building blocks and then combine them together to create a complex layout so i guess um the first thing you can see is like the header bar itself which is basically in like a fixed position so as you keep on scrolling it stays at the top and we'll get some more into that when we cover position uh, next week. Um, but yeah, the main content is within like this, I guess, yellow box. And then there's like margins on the side that have, um, I guess, give it more visual appeal. So if we break down even more, like what's in the actual container, um, you could have like a column on the left. So in that case, you might be want like a, a div and then each, like there's like elements in the div that have like, I don't know, title, like links and stuff like that. And then the right column, as you can see, is like, it's kind of like horizontal. There's like some vertical elements as well. So we want to break that down even more and then keep on going. So basically the picture of that squirrel is like one row. And then below that is like another row. And then we can break that down even further um, where basically you want to break down your components to the point where it's either one row or one column because that's basically how it's um i guess html is designed for you to be like designed to be used so think of like taking complex components and breaking them down into simpler ones yeah so this is kind of like when you combine a bunch of simple components into like one overall layout yeah i guess this is a really important part of the class too uh, which is chrome dev tools inspect element i'm maybe you guys have heard of it i'm not sure um but yeah this is basically the best way to debug like what's going like what's wrong with your code because i'm sure like whenever we like save the file and refresh the page like sometimes it doesn't work um we recommend you use this in chrome uh i don't even know how it looks like in firefox because i don't know anyone who uses that but um basically in order to get to the chrome dev tools uh, which is like you basically just right click or like double tap or whatever for your computer and then click inspect element you can all do like command shift i control shift i when you're on a windows basically what will pull up is like use chrome dev tools and then this might look super intimidating but uh you basically already learned most of this stuff already 
So when you go to the elements, these are all the HTML elements um, that you've rendered on the page. So as you can see, like there's like divs, um, there's like the doc type HTML at the top, HTML tag. Um, this is basically everything that you coded in like homework one. Um, and then I think remove this. Yeah, so if you click on a specific element, it shows you the CSS that's actually styling it. Um, and you can also double click the CSS um, if you wanna edit it within the browser. But once you edit it within the browser and you refresh the page, your changes will be gone. So this is basically like editing the CSS here is just gauging how it would look if you made those actual changes in like VS code. Um, but just be sure, don't do your entire project in the, like, the dev tools and then refresh it and it's all gone. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess these are some things you can do uh, with Chrome Dev Tools. So basically when you hover over an HTML tag, it'll show you like the box model diagram, which is like how wide the content is, how many pixels, like the padding margin border is. Um, you can also click on an HTML tag to see which CSS rules are affecting it as you saw before. And then you can also click on like a CSS property or value to edit the CSS, add properties and see what happens to it, like how it looks. And then if you click into the CSS rules area, you can add like CSS like specific HTML tags. Um, you can see like what changes happen. Yeah, so I guess like pretty common pattern in like layout structure is that there's always like a main container for the page that holds pretty much everything. And then the header like might be separate just because like, as we saw in like the Facebook example, it's kind of in a block of its own, but the rest of um, the elements should go in like that main container. And then if you see like a column, then that's usually like a div, or if you see like a row, that's usually like a div, and then you can put like pretty much whatever you want in there. Um, yeah, so if you put a bunch of columns next to each other, then that's like a row, I guess. So yeah, start from simple like components and piece together rows and columns. Eventually you'll have like a complex layout. Um, I guess, do you have, do you guys have any questions about anything? If not, I can probably just demo Chrome DevTools right now. Um, so, see. Uh, we go like so basically if you want to get to Chrome Dev Tools, you basically just need to do like the right click and then um, you could click this inspect feature. And these are basically all the elements that Google is currently using to like style this, this page. Um, so if you say you want to like look at like what this Google thing, like what, like CSS is being applied to this, right? You can click on this, like, uh, basically you click on this like tiny little thing that has like a cursor on it, you click it. And then when you hover over things, it'll tell you like where they are in the code and what elements are styling it. So if we click on this, we can see like this Google thing is actually like an image. And then like it's max height is like a hundred, max width is like also a hundred. And all these things are like, I don't know what they're doing here, but um, yeah, this is basically all, all the CSS that they're using. Um, this is also, I guess we can go into one of these buttons. Yeah, so I guess these are like one of the buttons, so like an input tag. Um, this is basically like, as you've seen before, like, like background color, border, border radius, color, font family. These are all CSS selectors that you've seen before. Um, so yeah, Chrome DevTools, like it seems pretty intimidating, um, but at the end of the day, it's like, things that you've done before. And here's also the console. Usually if you like mess up an element, there'll be like some error message here. Um, usually these like yellow warnings don't actually do anything, like you can disregard them. But if you're wondering like what's wrong with your code, um, you can check out the console and see if there's anything there. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for the programming portion of the lecture. Um, if there's like no more questions. Yeah. So in the one of the first 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 slides, mm -hmm. there was I remember you first explained like uh, the border and the width, the border and okay, down, 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 down. Right there. Uh -huh. Uh so how come why is there a space between welcome to WDE and then homework? Oh, like, um, I think that's just because the 
like default display for HTML uses like display block, as we said before, where everything goes on its own line. So even like without any CSS, you can see like that there's like a separation in between like welcome what it out and then a new line homework three will be released tonight. And then the reason why there's like the space on the bottom, uh, like between those two white boxes is because we had like the margin 30 pixels. So if you don't specify a direction you want the margin in, it'll automatically apply it on all sides. So I think if we go to here, like the yellow is like the margin, which is why um, I guess they're separated like that. If that answers your question. Yeah, but okay, now go back, go, go to border. Mm -hmm. Now go to padding. So how come it didn't make the box one just big box? So basically like how it works is like the content is like, you can think of like the picture itself. The padding is, Consider like also as part of like the picture, like anything within the picture frame is like part of the picture. So say we took this like, um, I guess, instead of doing like background color white, say we took this background color and made it like black or something. This will basically take the padding and the content itself and make it black. Uh, but in this case, we chose white, so which is why like the content, uh, I guess the content, the, the text is actually blue, but um, like it'll take the padding and the element and then that, that'll apply that background color to it. So the padding is considered like part of the element. And then if you want to like separate elements, you use margin instead. Yeah, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. All right. uh, any more questions? All right, cool. Okay. Um, also, just a disclaimer, I'm a little bit sick, so <laughs> bear me if my voice is like kind of cocky. But yeah, we're going to get into the design lecture now, which this week we'll be covering typography in web design. Um, and yeah, you can kind of see like a cute theme on the slide deck where we have two different types of typography. Um, it's kind of just like a sneak peek into different types of type that we can use when we're designing websites. Um, okay, um, but before we get into like the specifics of typography related to web design, here's like a quick cheat sheet of CSS properties and like useful things that Stephen just covered in his lecture regarding like formatting. So you can see like the box model over there and different display types such as like block, inline and inline block, um, just for like a nice visual of it. Um, there's also some like important slash useful selectors on the left side over there. Um, so feel free to like use this um, when you're starting your projects, but we'll post it on Ed for like a reference later on in the class. Yeah, in terms of typography, why is it important? Um, essentially, we want to think about how people read things um, when we look at websites, um, because it's very hard to read things that are like yellow, for example, like in the color to this, um, or fonts that are like really uh, messy or might be a little bit harder to, um, for legibility purposes. So that's like the main concept of why we want to consider typography pretty heavily in design, since um, a lot of web content is really content heavy and we want to prioritize legibility as well as readability for our users. So just as a quick definition, type is a beautiful group of letters, not a group of beautiful letters. And what I mean by this is kind of typography evokes like the kind, the kind of personality and character of a website. So when we think of like how a well-designed website looks like, um, it, a good typography usage would convey this type of character or personality. So you can kind of see in the GIF here where there's a mixture of sans serif and serif fonts to convey that sort of like playfulness of whatever website we're designing. In tangent with this, we can also look at branding, which gets into more of the coloring and the kind of like visual aspect of um, combining typography and graphics. Um, and branding can essentially showcase a variety of emotions through the typography as well, and really elevate the type of vibe, I guess, that the font phase conveys. Over often, oftentimes in your websites, more than 80% of the information is expressed as pure text. Like I mentioned before, a lot of websites that are more utility based, such as maybe like a newspaper website or like even a storefront, 
will employ a lot of text just to explain like what the concept is or what the article is, for example. So it's super important to consider this um, when you are employing those fonts in your websites. So let's communicate effectively with different types of typography um, properties, such as style, weight, and color. And that's kind of what we'll be covering in the lecture today. So now that we kind of have a gist of why it's important, how do we make typography work in the first place? Um, so this is Carla, which is the type of font that we use in web design. Um, and now we can kind of break away from that mold and explore different fonts that might be different from our own web design branding. The two different types, the two main different types of typography that we can break the, this category into are serif and sans serif fonts. Serif fonts have a little flick where the letter forms terminate. So if you think of like Times New Roman, for example, um, it has like a little end notch on the type. Um, and in general, they feel a little bit more classy, a little bit more formal, maybe even a little bit like vintage if you've seen like older branding and packaging, for example. Um, and Times New Rim is, is actually a default font without um, any CSS styling properties. So if you don't apply any styling, you'll automatically have Times New Roman. Uh, when we think about sans serif fonts, um, the sans kind of indicates that it's like without serif, so it does not have the flick. Um, and generally it feels more modern. If you think of things like Arial or Helvetica or Carla, um, and that's the, if you can see the pictures, the one on the left is sans serif and the one on the right is serif. So differentiator of the two main buckets of typography. Again, here are some examples of those two fonts employed on actual websites. Um, as you can see on the left, serif feels already a lot more classy and reserved. Uh, as you can see on this Vogue website, um, they employ a lot of uh, serif fonts as well as italics to convey that like fashion editorial type of vibe versus Nike, which is a little bit more of the opposite spectrum in terms of fashion, um, where it feels more modern and technical and a lot more kind of new vibes. So that's a nice visual of how you can think about these two different types of fonts. Um, another way of bucketing these two types is to think about how fonts look in a more contained environment. So when you have paragraphs, for example, or a lot of content on one page, um, serif usually is employed heavily in things like newspapers, or if you guys know of Medium, which is like a website where people can publish their own writing, um, typically you'll see serif fonts on there for that text heavy content, um, because typically it's a lot easier to parse serif fonts. Um, on the other end, we see that sans serif um, is typically employed in more image heavy content, um, using things like captions um, and just conveying that more cleaner look rather than focusing on large paragraphs. Now to get into a little bit of weight, um, fonts typically come in a variety of different font weights and we call the entire group of fonts a typeface. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but essentially using weighting in typography is really helpful to convey that type of hierarchy, which is kind of what I mentioned last, last lecture. Um, so you can see in the example, the top most type in Bonjour is very bold. It's what your eye catches first. And then below that, it's a little bit less bold. It's what we call medium, um, less of a font weight, which is kind of like a subtitle, for example, or just like a divider within the content. And then finally we have light, which is typically used in like paragraph text. Um, so you can see like in the blocks right next to the text that um, it's a helpful way of kind of breaking down which parts of the page you want the reader to catch their eye to first, and then which parts of the page are maybe uh, more supplemental or more just like, a big thing to read. In general, we like to say to use almost around two to three fonts per website. Um, this is due to kind of like the first quote that I mentioned, which is typography is a group of beautiful fonts, not a um, not like using a bunch of different fonts at the same time, for example. So this is kind of just a rule of thumb so that you guys are able to um, cleanly lay out the types of text and content that your website employs. And I think we get into some examples where more than three fonts gets a little overwhelming. In general, type is also not an exact science. So unlike kind of more the coding parts of things, um, sometimes they can feel more freeform. 
Um, and you'll see in the later examples where sometimes aligned isn't always perfectly aligned. Um, we can use grids to kind of help us guide this alignment. For example, you can see here where you break down the page into different boxes. Um, you see this frequently in newspapers where they have a bunch of columns um, and that helps the reader kind of guide their vision a little bit better. Um, for example, we have the square grid on the very end as well as a 12 column, which um, kind of breaks it down into different pillars for you to align your content to. So if you have a paragraph, you align it to the line on the left side, um, or we have like a five column, which typically I think you can might, you might see this in a lot of posters um, where it's a, a lot bigger of a space to kind of position your text. Um, but here are some examples kind of of how you can align your text when you have a lot of things going on. And this is what I was mentioning about the alignment thing. So a lot of times, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but um, in Google Docs, for example, when you're typing something a lot larger um, over something that's maybe a paragraph, the text actually shifts a bit. So just like in the font package that you download, there might be a small space on like the left side of the B, for example. And when we're designing, typically like that looks a little like it's very nitpicky, but it could look kind of off. So in order to align it, we maybe we might have to eyeball it um, and shift it over a little bit. And you can see in the GIF where um, you might have to manually adjust for that white space on the left side to account for the little bit of non-text alignment. In general as well, we want to pick a font that has a lot of different weights. Like I mentioned, typically when you're like searching for fonts on Google, Google fonts or like Adobe fonts or different websites, um, more of the popular ones may come in different weights already. Um, this is a good thing because you want to be able to have different types of hierarchy. So if you do find a font that might not have as many, um, I would say prioritize the one that has um, different types like light or regular or Roman, bold, black, um, just so you have more leeway in terms of um, paragraph versus heading text. And like I mentioned before, all of these equal the type face. So one type of weight would be a type and then all four would be a type face. Now to get into a little bit of spacing. So we've talked about kind of like what the, what the letter itself represents, like the weight and the um, bolding and such. Um, but what about what if these lines exist together? So um, when we use line spacing, this is also another important part of parsability. Um, we like to keep things as kind of like legible as possible. So on the left side, we see that we're using a 1.2 um, spacing, right? Um, and it kind of like makes the text look a bit shorter, a little bit less of a left and right. If you have a longer paragraph, try to increase your line spacing as you know, there's a lot more text to read. So it's harder to parse that when there's like, when the text is vertically really compacted. So kind of a rule of thumb where if it is a shorter text, um, you can use a slightly shorter um, line spacing, but if you have a longer piece of text, try to use a slightly larger one. So there's more space in between those lines. Another thing is the actual width of the block that you're using in your text. So if you've seen on like newspapers, for example, um, there might be really small columns where it's easy to kind of go left and right and read the entire story. Um, for example, um, there's also things like medium where maybe the width is a little bit larger. So in general, try to keep it between those two block uh, examples, I guess. So um, something between like 40 and 70 characters per line. Um, and you can kind of eyeball this as well, where and like maybe experiment on yourself, where if it gets a little bit too long, it might be a little harder to read. So that's kind of just a example. Usually like, don't be afraid to have more margins on both sides because um, if you compare that to something more text-based, um, it can be a lot harder to read from left to right in lengthy terms. Another thing is to use contrast. So um, this is kind of like a question of when you use black text versus when you use white text. So um, this is another like lesson in accessibility, I guess, where um, you know if someone is colorblind in a certain way, they need higher contrast to be able to read things. So um, something like a lighter green, for example, on a white text, someone might not be able to read that um, versus someone who is not colorblind. So we wanna use as much contrast as possible to be able to um, allow all of our users to be able to read things. Um, and there's actually a cool plugin. I think it's like a double A test or triple A text 
test where you can um, install it on your laptop and see if things are actually accessible. Um, I don't know if this is in the slides, but I can link it on Ed later. Um, but yeah, in general, use black when it's a lighter background and use white when it's a darker background. And to sum it all up, I guess, um, don't try to nerd over typefaces. It can be like a pretty niche thing to like, I don't know, a lot of people have a lot of obsessions over typography. Um, and it can get really easy to kind of just like go on Pinterest or go on Google and like find all these cool typefaces. Um, but don't spend too much time on it unless you really want to. Um, a lot of the times just pick one, you know, a lot of fonts can have a lot of differences, but they can be really small differences. Um, think more large picture. Um, think about the types as blocks, for example, um, alignment, um, hierarchy, use these contrast rules that we mentioned. Um, and yeah, those are, if you like keep all those things in mind, you should be good to go. Okay, but how do you choose a font? <laughs> Like I mentioned earlier, it's good to choose a font that has a lot of different weights. So having a typeface is really useful. And I think Google Fonts typically has a lot of these typefaces. Like I don't think Google Fonts usually supports fonts that only have like one molding, for example. So Google Fonts is a really great place to find these. Um, it also have a lot of clean fonts that are very popularly used in websites. So that's a good place to start. There's also something called typesample.com, which gets more like modern and artsy, I guess, um, employing fonts that don't typically exist, like not your typical Helvetica or your Carla. So that's also another cool resource. You also have TypeWolf, um, which I think TypeWolf is more kind of like branding focused where it will actually give you examples of fonts on like different colors, for example, or posters. Um, and that can be a cool way to gain inspiration. And then there's what font um, where you can actually, I think this is like a, sorry, an extension maybe where you can like distinguish what the font is on a certain website if you like it and it catches your eye. Another quick tip on this is to use inspect element in your Chrome um, so that you can see like what the font family is. Um, but that's a cool tool to use as well. And yeah, um, there are a lot of exceptions when it comes to typography. Again, like it's not an exact science. Um, there's a lot of many styles as well. And like a lot of designers tend to break the boundaries in terms of like what type they use and like how legible it is. So depending on if you want it more artsy, you can keep it that way in the font. But um, we want to enforce more usability focus. So try to use the properties that we mentioned earlier to make sure that your font is clean and modern and easy to read. Um, ultimately, it's all about what you want to communicate through your font. Um, so get inspired and like look at all these examples that we're giving you to uh, understand what you want to create and how the font will help you in that way. There's actually also a Korean Google Fonts. I'm not really sure why this example is up here, but um, if you speak Korean, you can use that. Um, there's also like different language typographies that you can explore um, if, for example, you're bilingual and you want to include that on your website too. It can also give you some inspiration for different types of characters and how they're portrayed in like italics versus sans serif. Um, and it can be a cool way to employ 